Hello and welcome to the weekly outlook for January 22nd by AAA FX. This is Chris taking a look at markets around the world. The market on Monday will be very quiet. There's really not a lot going on. There are a couple of prime rate announcements in China. Not really market movers. Typically, they, they can sometimes put a little bit of risk on if the Chinese central bank decides to uh, liquefy the markets a bit more. But really, at this point in time, just don't see anything happening. So with that being said, Tuesday kicks off really early. So Monday's probably quiet. Tuesday kicks off really early with the Bank of Japan's monetary policy statement. For the Japanese, it's time to put up or shut up. They have been saying for quite some time that they may try to normalize rates. If they don't do anything, this could be very bad for the Japanese yen. Interesting, too, because the Japanese yen has started to sell off quite drastically again. So I think Tuesday is going to be very interesting for those yen-related pairs. We don't really know when this announcement comes out. The Japanese just kind of do it whenever. They just release it via wire and then call everybody into a press conference it's it's kind of remarkable really a little later in the day we get cpi out of new zealand that will be a mover of the new zealand dollar um beyond that probably doesn't have too much in the way of effect on the markets consumer price index will give you an idea of what inflation is doing wednesday very big day so wednesday has PMI numbers in manufacturing and services, France, Germany, EU, UK, United States. All of that gives you more of an inflationary picture. It seems to me that most traders have it in their head that inflation is going to um, abate. And if that's going to be the case, then these numbers will be watched. It's almost more like If inflation numbers come in as expected, there probably won't be much of a reaction. What you need to worry about is if they come in hotter than anticipated. Most central banks around the world are expected to start easing fairly soon, some sooner than others. But at the end of the day, uh, we don't like surprises when it comes to inflation right now. The lower the number, the better it's going to be for risk assets. One thing that's worth watching during the day beyond that will be the BOC, the Bank of Canada uh, Interest Rate Statement, Monetary Policy Report, and Press Conference. That will uh, give you an idea of what the Canadians think their economy is going, uh, or how it's going. Right now, the overnight rate is 5%. It is expected to stay the same, which, going back to the Japanese, they are currently at negative 0.1%. That tells you just how huge of a difference there is between central bank policy around the world. Even if Canada were to cut, for example, 25 basis points, we'd still be talking about a 4.85% difference between Canada and Japan, um, just as an example. So looking at the Thursday session, things get really interesting with the ECB. Now, the ECB is not expected to do much, but what people are going to be looking at is the statement and, you know, whatever they have to say in the press conference, because there are various economies in the European Union that seem to be slowing down. And if that's the case, people are going to be looking to see whether or not Uh, The ECB sounds a little bit more dovish. If they do, that will be very negative for the euro. If they don't, then people will start to go back to shorting the dollar would be my anticipation. In the middle of all of this, we get the advanced GDP, which is going to throw a monkey wrench in everything. GDP dropping is what most traders want to see because they want that cheap and free money coming from the Federal Reserve. We also get the weekly unemployment claims. Probably not a big mover unless it misses completely, but right now it's expected to be 199,000. Again, I think the big thing probably is the ECB press conference, unless, of course, they surprise and actually cut. And then finally on Friday, we get the core PCE price index. This is the Federal Reserve's favorite inflation number. That being said, I think at this point, the game's up. People expect the Fed to cut, 
And it just is what it is unless there's some kind of massive shift in the economy. Looking at the charts, you can see that the euro did pull back during the week. But again, I think this coming week is going to be interesting for the euro. We'll probably get some type of directionality that could lead the way for the next several weeks. We'll have to wait and see, though. But right now, we're dead in the middle of the consolidation phase between 1.10 and 1.0. 750 and i think we've got a neutral market we more likely than not will stay in this range but if again if the ecb shocks that could really move this pair looking at gold it did fall to the crucial two thousand dollars level it has held up quite well during the week we're starting to see more of that buy the dip mentality come into the market I think because of this, we've got a situation where gold will eventually take off to the upside. If and when it can take out $2,075, we really could see traction pick up at that point. Gold, of course, is going to be heavily influenced by interest rates, especially in America. And at this point, geopolitics has to come into the picture as well because the situation in the Middle East is getting worse, not better. Then, of course, we have a lot of other festering issues out there as well so there could be a bit of a safety trade anyway silver a little different and you would expect that because silver is also an industrial metal much more than gold is at least looks like we're still stuck between 22 dollars and 26 dollars i suspect we stay in this range most of the year we're closer to the bottom of the range and the fact that gold seems to have buyers i think silver could do fairly well over the next couple of weeks do I expect it to shoot straight up in the air? No, of course not. But I think you've got a real shot at some stability and in, in, in maybe a, a short-term rally for a couple of bucks. We could go as high as 26 and not a lot would have changed. Bitcoin at first looked pretty negative, but Friday is really starting to see um, some recovery here. So let me go ahead and get that. You can see how we've bounced. And it does look like Friday is trying to save the week, as it were, at the crucial 40,000 level. This, to me, suggests consolidation, and that does make a lot of sense. You have to think about the fact that the Bitcoin ETF has been announced. In fact, most of what we saw here uh, from about 25,000 to 47,000 or so was based on that ETF coming out. Well, it's out now. Now we need to find some type of catalyst to continue going higher. Either way, I think market participants are going to have to work off some of this excess froth. I anticipate we're going to be stuck in this range for a while. This candlestick for the week really hasn't changed that at all from what I've seen. Ethereum. Ethereum is hanging around $2,500. Taking its lead from Bitcoin. I think $2,100 underneath is your floor. You know, if we do rally at this point, I'd be interested in perhaps trying to run it up to the 3000 level could go a little higher than that, quite frankly, but I think that's a reasonable expectation, but you need to see some momentum. I do assume this is more of a buy on the dip type of market going forward as well. And why wouldn't it be as long as Bitcoin is somewhat stable and people believe that we could see an Ethereum ETF coming next. Well, that's a good sign. There are a lot of court cases in the United States right now trying to determine whether or not crypto is some type of security. And it does look like perhaps the courts might side with crypto. And it's not so much an Ethereum story. It's the fact that Ethereum is what everything else piggybacks off of. So could look good in the long term. But in the meantime, I expect to see a little bit of volatility more buy on the dip. Dollar yen has taken off. We get the Bank of Japan next week, though, so that could cause a lot of noise. At this point, I still look at this as a buy on the dip market with 145 yen being massive support. We also have an uptrend line that's held quite nicely. You know, the past three weeks have been pretty strong. Uh, we started out at 140.8. We're at 148. A little bit of a pullback is probably necessary. To truly continue going higher for what it's worth the uh, Friday candlestick does look like it's showing signs of exhaustion here so I think it all ties together 
The Japanese may try to jawbone the market down a little bit and suggest that maybe someday they'll tighten monetary policy. That works for a minute and then we reverse. So I suspect that we may see something like that. But again, it's just buy on the dip. The Aussie dollar has fallen to the bottom of this range here to test 0.65. It has bounced quite nicely. When I look at the daily chart, you can see we are building some type of an attempt to rally. If we can get above this 200-day EMA, then I think 0.67 is a very reasonable target. After that, you could be looking at a move to the 0.69 level. This whole area here between 0.69 and 0.65 gives you 400 pips to consolidate in. I think that makes a lot of sense in the Aussie. So I will continue to look at it through that prism. Crude oil markets. This is WTI. So it's just below 75. This is Brent or UK. So it's just below 80.50. They look the same. They both look like they are trying to build some type of base. That makes a lot of sense at this point because although we have an oversupply of oil, if central banks are going to start cutting rates, there's a good shot that we see increased economic demand. And if that's the case, then oil does really well. It's a major bottom that we have recently tested in both grades. So I do think that they have more upside potential than down. We need a catalyst though. That catalyst could be, a, it could be an announcement of a cut. It could be an announcement of the SPR being refilled in the United States, which by the way, stealthily it has been over the last five weeks. It could also have a lot to do with an attack in the Red Sea. We just don't know. But this is where you would expect to see the market pick itself up. Right now, this could be what is thought of as accumulation if you're a Dow theorist. The S&P 500 has fallen to the 4,700 level and then just took off during the, especially Friday. When I look up the daily chart, you can see Friday, we have broken that resistance. So I think this is buy on the dip. Absolutely zero interest in shorting this market. And you can say that about all U.S. indices. It's all about that cheap money coming from the Fed. The U.S. dollar has tested 1.35 and gave up those gains against the Canadian dollar as we're hanging around the 50-week EMA. I think that is essentially, I'm going to call this fair value. And the only reason I call it fair value is it's like right in the middle of this range. So makes sense if we break the top of this candlestick we should go to 139. in that environment the us dollar would be strengthening against everything so you know pay attention to the euro the pound all these other currencies uh dollar swiss ironically enough looks extraordinarily bullish and i don't know this but i did mention this a week or two ago about how sooner or later the swiss national bank will lose its sense of humor they do have a habit of intervening in the markets and then talking about it later. Maybe that's happened. I don't know. But the 0.87 level is an area on longer term charts that's important. It's worth noting that we stopped right about there. So be looking for signs of exhaustion. The DAX in Germany has dipped below 16,500. This was an area I thought could be support. It has held up so far. I like the idea of buying the DAX. One would assume that it's going to take its cues from Wall Street so once the Germans get back on board on Monday, could very well see some bullish behavior. That will be especially true if the ECB sounds even remotely dovish on uh, later in the week on Thursday, I believe. So over here in the FTSE 100, you can see that we have broken down pretty significantly for the week. We will find support near 7230. This is just a very neutral market. You look at the daily charts. You, know, you can see we tried to rally on Friday, may have to drift a little bit lower. We'll have to wait and see. Dow Jones 30 has taken off for the week, uh, has broken out to a fresh new high. I think we're very likely going to be a buy on the dip market. I've been saying that all week. The weekly chart doesn't look any different. British pound fell, then turned around. Looks like we're just hanging around this 1.2750 level, looking for some type of momentum. I don't know what causes it to go higher, but if we can clear the top of the candlestick here at 128.32, that opens up the door to 1.3250. Breaking down below the lows of the last several weeks at about 126 opens up 125. The Nikkei 225 has been on fire and it is going to close the week at the very highs again. 
It's a very good sign. You don't want to chase it. This is a market that you need to buy the pullback. With the Bank of Japan coming out early Tuesday morning, we could get a bit of a sell-off on Monday as people try to square positions, getting away from danger. NASDAQ 100, straight up in the air. Should not be a huge surprise. There's only seven stocks that move the NASDAQ anymore. As long as the usual suspects, Tesla, NVIDIA, Microsoft, as long, you know, Apple, as long as they're doing well, the index goes higher because it's something like 40% of the index. British pound, Swiss franc. Looks a lot like the U.S. dollar chart, U.S. dollar Swiss franc chart. We are getting to a point where this might be a potential buy. We will have to see how the pound does against the dollar. If it ticks off against the dollar, this might actually be the backdoor play. Buying the pound against the franc, aiming for 1.15. Not only do you get the appreciation, but you would also get a positive swap at that point as well. The U.S. dollar against the Mexican peso, I bring up this chart because it gives you an idea of what the U.S. dollar is going to do against emerging markets. And right now, it doesn't look like it's going to do a whole lot. It did try to rally for the week. We are forming a bit of a double bottom, but gave back the gains. What will be interesting is that if the U.S. economy rolls over, then the U.S. dollar appreciates against currencies like the peso because they're so heavily reliant on the U.S. economy for exports. At this point, though, this looks like the U.S. dollar is probably going to continue to soften, except against the franc. And like I said, I think there are some behind-the-scenes shenanigans going on over there. So you definitely have to keep that in mind. The S&B will eventually come clean and say they involve, were involved. Uh, but it's a small enough currency, even though it's a major currency, that they can stealthily go in there and move things around anytime they get a little uh, concerned. And in fact, the one chart that uh, really can bring that into focus at times is the Euro Swiss. So I'll just bring that up. And you can see it's gone straight up in the air. Now, why the Euro Swiss? Well, the Euro Swiss, because Switzerland's number one market, of course, is the European Union. And you can see that we're at just a little under 95. And we are so oversold at this point, it's not even funny. So with that being the case, I think you have to look at this through the prism of watching all of the Swiss related pairs that could end up being the play is just to short the franc, but we would need to see simultaneous action. I'd watch the Euro, the British pound, the U S dollar against the franc, pay attention to all of those. They all three should move in the same direction with that should be a rather eventful week but it's going to get a very slow start on monday again as there's no real economic announcements coming out so we'll have to see how the week kicks off might be a situation where you have to wait till tuesday